My name is Michael Blackburn, one of the staff members, and I really do want to give you a big welcome. Uh, we had a great week last week to see the pictures of our uh, middle school mission trip uh, that we got back uh, Friday afternoon for, and we'd appreciate all your prayers, uh, not just for that trip, but all the, all the trips we've had this summer. And I want to thank all the adults who went on that trip uh, to make that happen, Dorothy Wilson and Kara Scyther and the interns who who took a week off uh, so that we could live out our mission statement to be the, uh, the living body of Christ. And uh, we it definitely, the mission trip was a place where we definitely helped some folks, but we definitely got a lot out of it too. And it, uh, you guys would have been very proud of the middle schoolers um, and how they're not just represented our, our church, but uh, their faith this week. Uh, we've got coffee and snacks over there, so please uh, take part of that anytime during the service. Um, and again, just want to just welcome you this morning uh, to this place of worship. I, I hope that uh, however your summer's going, um, it, it's been awesome, and that and that today you can you can come in here and we can just lift up praise and and uh, and just worship here this morning. So let's all stand as we sing this morning. songs be a sign we are here for you we are here for you let your breath come from heaven fill our hearts with your life we are here for you we are here Oh, 
Again, I want to welcome everyone. My name is Michael Blackburn, one of the staff members here, and I want to make sure before you leave, you get one of these calendars. It's our summer calendar. We're coming down to the end of it. We're getting into August, uh, but we still have a lot of things um, that you can connect with us. We've got rafting that's coming up next Saturday, and you can sign up for that um, either uh, this morning or at the church office to make sure you know you're coming. Um, and the, the age range is for that. Four and forty pounds, um, but it, it's. I mean, you're on the river, but it's not. It's not rough. We can. Uh, if you are, if you are those dimensions and that age, you're able to do it. And um, and even up, 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 up. Anyone can go. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun um, with that. Also on the fifth of August, we've got bowling uh, that afternoon. It'll be church wide. It's also the last fifth on the fifth. Those, those rising sixth graders, those fifth graders. Um, uh, this summer that we've been meeting on every 5th, uh, they'll come to the church-wide bowling there, and that'll be our last event um, with that. Also, on the other side of this, has all our ongoing programs, and is a great way to get yourself, your youth, your child connected uh, to our church uh, uh, now. Um, we've got Wacky Worship Wednesday, um, our last one this, uh, this week. If, you, if you've missed... The other two is okay. You can come. Um, we've got to sign up for your kids. Also, we've got um, opportunities for people to help in that. Uh, we have fair trade uh, coffee and chocolates that are for sale uh, today. Not only does this uh, help the ministry, that uh, the fair trade ministry, but all the proceeds for that goes to the um, Breakfast and Bible for the uh, middle school and high schoolers um, during the school year. Those are the announcements that I know. Are there any others that I might have missed? Yes. Oh, that's right. Sign up for golf. That'll be this week. Um, that is, I think they're in the bulletin this week. Um, on the 24th, we're having a swing for the kids. Um, our goal is to raise $10,000 to be able to pay for our, our middle school after school uh, for the entire year next year uh, with this tournament. Uh, we've already had a great response from our sponsors, and we're getting some teams now. Uh, if you'd like to sign up, you can do that um, in your bulletin um, uh, with the insert in your bulletin. Put it in the uh, offering today or bring it by the office. You can also do it online. Uh, there's a link um, when you go to the front page. You can do that and get your team all set up that way. And that's on the 24th, uh, which is the Friday before back to school bash. So I think kids are already back in school on that um, on that week, and then it'll be the Friday before the back to school bash. Um, also, I guess Stop Hunger Now is coming up. I feel like that we need to probably mention that as we're getting closer to that. It's on the the 12th, and and if you've never done that, it's an amazing event. We'll clear this space out here, and we'll have. Tables all set up as we, uh, we we make thousands of meals that will go out to other places there. So those are the big big events that are coming up uh, with that. And so we're just glad to have everyone here. Let's all stand and greet one another with the uh, peace and love of Christ. All right, this is one of those songs we need your voices this morning. It doesn't have to be on pitch or in tune. It's really more of a joyous noise, loud noise this morning. Something that means 
stood before creation, eternity in your hand. Earth spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before creation and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulder, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me. Life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. What can I say? What can I do? Scout Powell to come up. She's been one of our interns, and we've had a pleasure to hear from each of our interns uh, this summer. And Scout just came back from our middle school uh, mission trip, and so we're always glad to have all our interns, but especially excited to have Scout here this morning. Good morning. My name is Scout Powell, and this is my second summer interning at the church. 
I'm an upcoming third year at the University of Virginia's School of Nursing. I've attended this church since I was about three days old when my parents rushed back to attend Wonderful Wednesday after my adoption. As I got older, I attended Sunday school with Miss Jane Baker and youth where I played in the praise band for two years and participated in both wilderness trail and mission trips where Mike Blackburn and many others had to put up with my crazy and loud self. Mission trips have become my favorite part of my summer and I've overall participated in eight throughout middle school and high school. My first mission trip was in sixth grade in Clarksville, Georgia, where our youth group helped to build a ramp as well as repaint the home of the family we were working for. Every day, the woman whose home we were fixing would welcome us in with open arms and cook us a huge lunch to thank us for the work we had done. And not once did we have to sit outside in the Georgia heat eating the sandwiches that we had prepared the morning of. The amount of gratitude she had shown us in her actions is forever embedded in my memory. This is when I also found my passion for serving others. The mission trip that has impacted me the most and showed me that mission work goes beyond just manual labor is when a small group of us my junior year in high school traveled to Bolivia. In Bolivia, we traveled between two children's homes, one in Ovahuyo and one in Takachia. In both places, we had the opportunity to meet and interact with the children that we were currently staying at the home. The amount of love and joy that radiated from each child was simply astounding. In Takachia, we helped to paint a small building where visitors would be able to stay. However, the work we did wasn't as important as the relationships we had built with the kids. This past week, I had the opportunity to join and be a part of the middle school mission trip in Tennessee. Going into the trip, I thought I knew what to expect of the upcoming week ahead of us. However, I was very wrong. Watching this group of middle school kids throughout the week reminded me of the power of God's love and the great things we can do as people when we work together towards a common goal. At the beginning of the week, a man that lived in the community we were working in stopped me and a few others to thank us and to also say he hoped his children would grow up to one day work as the hands and feet of God. His encouragement kept me and the others focused all week on our mission of love for the community. Although, although the work we did on some of the mission trips throughout the years may seem small to some, the impact it had on the families, myself, as well as those simply watching the process unfold was much larger. These mission trips sparked something within me, which was my love of helping and serving others as the hands and feet of God. Serving others has since helped me pick my major in nursing, where I hope to continue on to graduate school to become a continental family nurse practitioner. If it were not for this church family and the many opportunities such as mission trip, I would have never joined Nursing Students Without Borders as well as diversity in nursing for a better community to continue serving those outside my community. FUMC has become an integral part of me and I have learned that the relationships I have formed through this church will stay with me forever and that wherever I go in my calling, this church family will go with me. I hope to continue my journey in faith as well as continue serving those as the hands and feet of God. Thank you. We again are so thankful for all the college students who uh, give their summer here. We've had we have seven overall who are here, and uh, we just got started with Logan and, and Whitley last uh, week, and you'll hear from them the upcoming weeks. But um, we have to say goodbye to one uh, this Sunday. Lucy Hudson's leaving, um, and her family's here, and they're there. And so you might want to say bye to Lucy before um, uh, she takes off, because it's been it's an amazing summer. We're not able to do what, what we do without the interns um, from the pick picking and everything that goes on. So I'm just so, so grateful for them and, and uh, sad to lose uh, Lucy, um, uh, but it's so grateful to have her here this summer. Um, at this time, we'll ask our children to come forward as uh, Miss Sid will, will, will talk to them.
As our children return their seats, we'll ask the ushers to come forward as we give our gifts back.
is that God's grace finds us wherever we are and whatever we're doing at all points in our life. So I'll start out our community prayer as a congregation with a great praise for God's grace. How else can we pray together this morning? Yes. Surgery, cataract, and what's his name? Ira Johnson. So let's keep Ira in our prayers this week. Yes, Dan. Prayers to the family of Luann Ledford who passed away this, this past Friday. Indeed, uh, Mark Brown passed away tragically. Uh, let's play, pray for the Brown family brother Steve Brown, among other Browns. Any others? Praise, good to see Carl this morning. Also a praise for, uh, he's not up there now, but Kip, Kip Brock. We've had just the pleasure of having Kip Brock with us. Uh, during Carl's absence, and uh, he's actually the nephew of Kevin Brock. If you don't know Kevin, Kevin plays keyboard, synthesizer, banjo, all kinds of stuff. So appreciate Kip making the drive up from Greenville. Yes, Annabelle. Yeah, what a, pra what a praise this morning. Uh, great mission trips, both high school and middle school. Middle school just wrapped up. Uh, 33 middle schoolers together on mission. I mean, how awesome is that? That's pretty cool. So, a lot to look forward to with the youth program going forward. Also, make sure to uh, read your bullets, and there's a number of folks listed there that also need prayer, so let's keep all those folks in our, our prayers this week. All right, let's bow in prayer together. God, we lift you up this morning with great thanksgiving, and we ask for your presence in this place as Becky brings your word into our presence that we may hold on to things this morning that will help us be more like you and be the people that you want us to be. God, we lift up all those that were mentioned that are in need of, need of prayer, families that are grieving for loss, folks that are battling illness that uh, need to know that you're present that no matter what happens in that journey that that difficult journey that that you're there to support them and support the families around you and God we give thanks for that God we do thank you so much for for grace and help us to know that your grace is there and it'll find us we don't we don't have to go looking for it it's just just there it's free and we just have to accept you and, and want to have a relationship with you, and you'll give us that grace. And God, we pray that we'll extend that grace to others, that at times it's, it's so easy for, for all of us to maybe not want to do that for, for all kinds of reasons, but you, know, you, you teach us that, that grace is free. And God, I just pray this morning that we can be grace givers and not just grace takers. God, we ask your blessing upon each and every one here, all that are not here that are traveling. We pray that you'll keep them safe and, and bring them back home. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Becky Brown, associate pastor here, and happy to be with you in worship. It's good to see everyone. The scripture that I have for us today is from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. So then remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel 
and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting together the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We all long for peace, don't we? We all long to be peaceful with one another. So when I began studying this letter of Paul's to the Ephesians, I kept coming back to verse 14. It kept bringing me back. And that verse says, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. There's an awful lot of wall building out there, isn't there? It seems to me as if the world is busy building walls. Walls to keep people out. Walls to separate for safety. Walls to define our space. Walls to separate us from them. Sometimes having walls help us feel better. We feel protected. A nice fence protects our dog or our children. We feel safe. But other times the walls that we build make us feel unsettled and uncomfortable. They just don't sit right with us. Our family five and the dog makes six have been on a really fun adventure for the past two weeks and they'll tell you about it. We um, have been living with Andy's parents in Ball Creek, way up Upper Crabtree, um, for almost two weeks now, as our home is being remodeled. So we're grateful for their hospitality and their patience with going from a household of two to eight. So Caroline, age seven, and Jack, age four, have been sharing a bedroom and bunk beds for over two years. And probably both of them, if you ask them, wouldn't remember a time where they had their own room. But as they've grown up, Andy and I discussed, and we decided, you know, we really need for them to have their own space and have their own bedrooms. So, you know, see, they get along really well, but surprise, surprise, they have different personalities. They have different sleeping patterns. Caroline's an early riser. Jack likes to sleep in. They've been waking up at odd hours, playing together. Anyway, it's just not been good. So to prevent hostility in our household, to bring about peace, we have put up a huge wall (laughs) in our house. Our loft, which is our, was our common playroom where all of our toys were stored, where everybody in the family came together to play, now has been cleared out, and there's a big wall up to the ceiling in our house and a door put on there um, to make a bedroom for Caroline. And so we have been living this. We have been putting up these actual physical walls. So when I read this scripture preparing for the sermon, it took on a whole different message for me. Um, in our little context within our family because we're hoping to prevent fights because we have personal space, which is good. But we can also see how it can play out in the negative. Stay out of my room. This is my space. You can't touch these things. They're my toys. 
you know, all of those things that would come about when you have your own space to protect it. Don't touch this. It's my room. Slamming doors. You know, I can see it. And so this our challenge as our little family to not let that happen as often as it does. So we're going from a world of our room, our toys, to a world of me and mine. So it's going to be our little project as a family. But we as people, we do this all the time, right? We put up walls of division more often than we care to admit. And as people, we are inclined to develop a sense of belonging. A, we want to belong to a group. We want to belong to a community. And those things are important and a part of how we were created. When we belong, we set a clear standard of who we are and who we are not, sometimes more importantly. So think about it. If we join a sports team or maybe we join a gym, uh, we are athletes then, right? We are the people who take pride in our physical fitness. We are not lazy couch potatoes like myself who doesn't belong to a gym. So a dividing wall, okay? Um, We take pride in the schools we attend, right, or have attended our alma maters. Um, Wherever we go, it's it's definitely a better school. This one is better. Ours has better academics, a better way of life, a better worldview, better sports team, better students, better teachers, right? We do this, a dividing wall. Or the very church we attend, or the denomination that it is, of Christianity that it is. Our church is the best. Our theology is the right one. Our people are living the gospel better than those people over there in that church. A dividing wall. The walls themselves aren't necessarily all bad. Because they do make definition of who we are. And it's important to have a strong identity and to have boundaries. So those standards of healthy competition are good. But it it's good to have relationships with people that we agree with or people that we um, have things in common with, love the same things, love to do the same things. All of those things are good and beautiful. But the problem lies is when we are more focused on defining who we're not, and that creates a hostility to those who are not like us. Andy and I, when we first started dating, sorry, honey, I didn't tell you I was featuring you in the sermon, wherever you are in the back. So um, we had a lot of conversations, right? When first couples get together, we talked a lot, um, shared a lot about our lives, you know, for hours and hours on end, getting to know each other. And we had a great time of talking about all the things we had in common, our, our common upbringings in a lot of ways, um, the way things, the schools we went to, all of those things. But there were two things that I recall that were major divisions for us. And the one thing, one of those things was music our preferred music style. I grew up in Durham. Um, In Durham, I loved Top 40 and hip-hop music. That was my jam. So Andy said, ugh, you know, this music is terrible, which, eh. anyway. So, so yeah, but I was 18. Give me a break. So, anyway, um, he, so he said, you've got to listen to this music. It's called bluegrass. And I was like, okay. So he plays me some thinking, you know, as, as young love is budding, you know, oh, she's going to love this music and understand who I am. So he plays it. And I'm pretty sure I didn't say any nice things. Andy might be able to remember what I said, but I'm pretty sure I said, this is awful. You know, this is terrible hill, hillbilly music. Please turn it off. You know, didn't want to hear it. And then we came to a discussion of basketball and uh, which basketball team we pulled for. And we learned that his family has pulled for Carolina for generations. And I grew up in Durham. And one of my best friends growing up was the daughter to the assistant coach of the men's basketball team at Duke. Herein lies the problem. I was a huge Duke fan from a childhood, raised in the triangle, when before you knew, knew really what basketball was, you were asked the question, which color blue does your blood run? And you had to know and stick with it. And there are a few state people, you know, but not many. So most people <laughs> were blue. Is this truth? This is, this is truth. Growing up in Durham. So I love Duke basketball, you know, and he loves Carolina basketball. And these two shall never meet, right? And, and so this was another division from, you know, very early on in our relationship that was causing some hostility between the two of us from the beginning. Mainly for me. Wait till the end, buddy. Okay. 
Um, so anyhow, the two major groups that we're talking about in our Bibles today um, are the, in the Ephesians are Gentiles and Jews. And so the Jews had taken pride in their culture. They had, um, they had purity in their culture. They were the chosen one of God for generations. And then all of a sudden, these Gentiles who came along that had none of this history, um, very different from them, very different cultures, very different styles, very different worldviews, looked differently, dressed differently, ate different things. Now they were called to interact together, to be church, to be one body. This is Christ telling them, basically, through Paul, to be one. And so they are to share one faith and worship together. They didn't want to do that. To share meals and homes with one another, didn't want to do that. But yet, through God, in this one miracle, God created them and made them help them come together and reconcile through Christ as one church. So this is reconciliation on a huge scale. So reconciliation is possible even when it seems like it is the most impossible because of the grace of God. So Jesus has incorporated all of us, everyone, into the holy temple of the Lord. And all of us are called to participate in these good works of reconciliation, of coming together. A reconciliation that happens that's not just a dream, a hope for the future. Something that will happen when Jesus comes back and then all will be well. Reconciliation has already happened. It happened when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected the next day, three days later. And then was, was brought, that brought the community of God together as one. So it's already happening, has already happened. So in our kingdom of God, here in this world today, this is what our work as a church, as the people of God, is to be, a dwelling place for God on earth. So the church, of course, is not our building where where we stay and we come and we gather, but it is home to God in all of us. So when we gather together, As we are today, regardless of our differences, of those things that divide us, the community that we have here, that God has created, is one. So the divisions that we create, which harbor hostility or anger or hatred, they alienate us from God. Because the focus that we have is no longer on God. It's on the things that put a wedge between us. So this makes me ask the question, how are we as the church, our church, embodying the holy temple of the Lord with which Christ is the cornerstone? Within our walls, is it a peaceful space? When we have learned from Ephesians today that instead of building walls that separate, that maybe keep us safe and happy and well, we are, continued, we are asked to continue to build the temple where God can dwell. So in Christ, we are no longer separated but we are one. So once Jesus' ministry began, he drew a crowd almost everywhere he went. And the other scripture that we're reading in uh, traditional services this morning comes from Mark chapter 6. And it's little snippets from Mark chapter 6 talking about what this community was at the very beginning. So the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And when they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves, they saw many people going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And when they they had crossed over, they came to the land they were going, and they moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people recognized him rushed back to the region and began to bring the sick into him, over to him with mats wherever they heard that he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick out in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who were touched by it, touched by Jesus, were healed. So we hear about this community of encounters with Jesus And the people were gathering because they wanted to seek God's compassion through Jesus. They had heard about him and they wanted to be healed. They knew that their brokenness would be healed. And so these people that were gathering were all sorts of people. Everyone in those communities who had an ailment, who wanted to be touched by Jesus, who wanted to be close enough to just barely reach out and touch his garment. 
all of them were one and coming together for one purpose, to seek Jesus' holiness, to bring about positive change in their lives, to be healed from their brokenness, to have compassion and hear his teachings of a new story, of a new lesson of how to be as people. Quite the opposite from alienation and exclusion. So what is our draw as a church? Why do the crowds gather, gather here? Why do you gather in our crowds today, here in our church? When we come together, what do people find? Are we, as the body of Christ, conveying the message of unity, of peace, of holiness and healing? Are we teaching and embodying reconciliation? Or are we sometimes putting up walls of division and definition? Walls to say who we are not. Walls that are put up with the expectation of keeping the other out. Those who don't fit in to who we have determined is our demographic for those to reach. How can our body of Christ continue to evaluate the divisions that we have made and to seek to be more like the temple of God's children, even though we already are? How can our community of believers better articulate the sense that all people are welcome and included in in the family of God because we're all built together in one spirit in Christ? Nadia Boltz-Weber, and I know you're probably sick of hearing me talk about her, but she's got great examples in her books. And she's a pastor, a Lutheran pastor in the Church for All Sinners and Saints in Denver, Colorado. And she is um, fully tattooed, and she looks very different. She's, she has um, piercings and such. And so she started this church with the intention that she would reach all of those people who felt rejected by mainstream churches. So when she had this church plant, she hoped to reach the misfits, the recovering addicts, or those that are still addicted, um, people who were homeless, um, those who have tattoos, piercings, and brightly dyed hair. So this was her demographic of the people that she wanted to be in her church. So in her book, Pastrix, she talks about a frustrating time in her ministry. Her church attendance had stalled at 45, and she really wanted her numbers to be about 70 so that she wouldn't have to put more as much into it, you know? She was putting so much into her church, she thought there would be an easy um, distribution of of responsibility if we could just get to 70 people. So she took a gig to preach at the Red Rocks, and she preached on on Easter, and she took out an ad in the paper, and they had a full picture of her, and um, so she was hoping, okay, now people will find us, you know, they, they know we're here, they know what we're doing, and they will start flocking to our church. She thought this was great. So people started coming. People started coming in droves to her church because they were curious. They wanted to know what her church was like. But they were the wrong kind of different for her. She realized, she said, you know, my people that I'm trying to reach don't read the local paper. They read their internet on the, on, they read it on the internet. So they hadn't seen her ad to draw them in. So instead, here come all these people who looked like her parents. And she said, no, this is wrong. So she says in her book, So here were a bunch of people, baby boomers who wore Dockers and ate at Applebee's, who had driven in from the suburbs to consume our worship service because it was neat and so much cooler and more authentic than they could create themselves. God, she's tough. It it felt horrible, and I became angry, she says. And then I felt horrible that I'd become angry, and my precious little indie boutique of a church was being treated like a 7-Eleven. And I was terrified that the edgy, marginalized people whom we had always attracted would now come and see a bunch of people who look like their parents and think, this isn't for me. So see, the trouble is, she had become the very thing that she didn't want to be. She had become the very thing that were kicking people out. So she continues, if Stuart the big drag queen, Phil the aging hipster, or I walk into a middle American Presbyterian church, we might encounter a welcome that felt stretched and thin. Few of us at House for All Sinners and Saints feel comfortable in traditional mainstream churches. But the fact of the matter was that we ourselves were now giving tight smiles to straight-laced middle-aged men and soccer moms. So in order to deal with this problem she had in her church, she called a meeting. And she thought, we're going to talk about the sudden growth in our church and our demographics. And the hope of this meeting was to weed the people out, right? 
So to have everybody come together and talk about why they love their church, that was her, the subject of the meeting, why you have come to House for All Sinners and Saints, and why you wanted to, um, why this was your church, hoping that people would self-select, and those other people who didn't belong would get the message and leave. So it was quite the opposite, okay? So she had this meeting, and she, she calls it a time of heart transplant, where she realized, God, God you know, this is not what I, what I should have done. So she talks about how, you know, she was surprised by the power of the gospel. And this one child, this one person, um, shared the most profound statement in this meeting of sharing. And he said, Asher said, as the young transgender kid who was welcomed into this community, I just want to go on the record and say that I'm really glad there are people at church now who look like my mom and dad. Because I have a relationship with them that I just can't have with my own mom and dad. Bam. That's it. That is what this new Christian community that we're talking about in Ephesians 2 is, is, looks like. People who are very different living together as one. Living together in one holy temple in the Lord. Built together spiritually as a dwelling place for God. And so this church grew. And the crowds began to flock to the church. Became to flock to Jesus. Because they felt welcome there. They felt God's compassion. They felt that their, they knew that their brokenness would be healed by living together as resurrected people in the reconciliation made by the gospel of Jesus. So Nadi continues, you can look around at the 120 or so people gathered on any given Sunday and think, I am unclear about what all these people have in common. Out of one corner of your eye, there's a homeless guy serving, serving communion to a corporate lawyer and on the other corner is a teenage girl with pink hair holding a baby of a suburban soccer mom. And there I was a year ago, fearing the weirdness of our church was going to be diluted. <laughs> and so living together as reconciled people doesn't mean that we all think the same way. It doesn't mean that we have to be the same people. It doesn't mean that we have to all look and talk and be robotic and homogenous. So it's time for us to all stop thinking that our differences or our demographics or the boundaries that we have set up for ourselves are what define us. It's Jesus that defines us. And the early church recognized that there's something more important than being Jewish or being Gentile. Something more important that gives all Christians their true identity and reconciles them to one another. Something more important than musical style and basketball. And over the years, I will say that Andy and I have reconciled many things. I have developed a love for bluegrass because it really is wonderful music and really fun. And uh, we still pull for our shades of blue. But we're able to do so with respect for one another without causing harm most of the time. If it is harm, it's accidental, right? But you'll never catch him pulling for Duke, so don't worry. But when we eliminate our boundaries, this alone does not create peace. Peace only comes when we let go of the hostility that lives behind those walls. God not only tears down the walls, but unites the people in peace. And this new humanity is living in the kingdom of God. So thanks be to God. Would you please stand as we sing our last song?
go out into the world to live as resurrected people and preach reconciliation to the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray today. Amen.